Good evening. Welcome to the Elrod Center for Family and Community, located on the campus of Washita Baptist University in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, where Dr. Ben Sells is our president. I'm Lewis Shepard, Jr., Special Assistant to the President, pastor of the Greater Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, and a member of the Arkansas Hospice Foundation Board. What is Black, Brown, and the challenge of dying well? In America, African Americans, as well as Hispanics and other minorities, are at risk of not dying well. Historical lack of access and substandard health care for minorities over time has led to a general sense of mistrust and of many aspects of our modern health care system, including the understanding and utilization of hospice care. But change comes with understanding. Knowing what hospice care is and how to access it can help our minority populations and their families receive the comfort and respect they deserve when facing life-limiting illnesses. This online workshop is designed to help bring awareness to all of our communities about the problems and available solutions for minorities and end-of-life healthcare. Arkansas Hospice is presenting this program which is made possible by a grant from the Repsman Fund. It is the fourth and final session, and it is focused on Central Arkansas. Please note that nurses, social workers, nursing home administrators can receive one hour of continuing education by viewing this forum on tonight. You can access it through arkansashospice.com forward slash CEU. Our panelists for this evening. First, Ms. Reba Gaines is a graduate of Little Rock Central High School. She attended Henderson State University, but graduated from Philander Smith College with two BAs in social work. She attended graduate school at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, received a Master of Arts in Counseling with emphasis in Rehabilitation Counseling. She's a lifetime member of Bullock Temple CME Church, where Reverend Dion Barton is the pastor. The organizations with which she is affiliated include the Little Rock Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated and Elegant Ladies Incorporated. She was first employed with the Department of Human Services as a caseworker, children and family services, and also as an intake supervisor. She began working for Arkansas Hospice in 2001 as the unit secretary and office coordinator. And in 2010, she became the bereavement specialist. Thank you, Ms. Gaines, for joining us this evening. And thank you. Our next panelist is Dr. Mitzi Washington, uh, who was born and grew up in Searcy, Arkansas, and she's lived there most of her life. She graduated from Searcy High School received a BA from Hendricks College in Conway and attended medical school at UAMS. There she was the chief resident in pediatrics. Her initial job was with community health centers, especially in rural Arkansas, but she's been in private practice for the last 25 years, first in Jacksonville and for the last 11 years in Searcy. And even when she practiced in Jacksonville, she said she lived in her hometown because she had pride there, and she wanted to see the community of her youth to use her as an example of what hard work can bring about. She has volunteered on a regular basis in multiple projects in the community and have done so for over 20 years. And let me introduce Dr. Mitzi Washington. Thank you, Dr. Washington, for joining us this evening. Glad to be here. Glad to be here tonight. Great. How can our listeners participate? <clears throat> right now, questions can be forwarded to our panel discussion by visiting arkansashospice.org. At the bottom of the page is a link 
for questions and discussion topics for minority utilization of hospice care can be submitted. Listeners can also submit their questions live during the program, but we encourage everyone to send in their questions now. The first question uh, that we will deliver to the panelists involves some of what both of you have written about in your biographies. And I didn't want to read that because I wanted it to come from your lips as opposed to mine. And everyone has a hospice story of some type. Share with us your hospice story and how you, as a minority, a person of color, first encountered hospice care and the impact it's had on you. Dr. Well, Washington, Dr. What? You I'll speak. <laughs> uh, my very first job was working at uh, what was then called White River Rural Health, and now it's our care. And I was a physician in the Carlisle Medical Clinic. And um, there was a young lady who had a sister who had died, uh, who was in the process of dying and, die and died, and she, Teresa Travis. And she started in one of the very first hospices that I was aware of in the area. And she happened to have known me from medical school and needed someone to help and work. And so she called and said, you're a young doctor. You got some spare time. You don't have any kids. You don't have any responsibilities. Can you work for me? Well, you know, you're poor when you get out of medical school. So if she's going to pay me a little extra, I said, okay. I didn't really know what hospice was at the time. And so I got a good introduction to it. And the hospice that she initially started, it had a theme. And it said, adding life to days when there are no more days to add to life. And it took me a few years to figure it out. And then I one day figured it out that this is how everybody, no matter what your status in life, could die like the rich and famous. Comfortable with all the meds you need with your family at your bedside. You didn't have to die in a sterile hospital environment if that was not your desire. You, all the grandchildren, the cousins and aunts and uncles could all be gathered around you. You could be made comfortable and it could be a celebration because in the community that which I grew up in, death was a sad thing because we'd miss people, but it was also a celebration and we knew what was coming afterwards. And so it allowed me to help families to celebrate the life of their family members. Thank you. Ms. Gain, what was your first uh, affiliation with hospice? Well, in 2001, I began my employment with Arkansas Hospice, my journey. Uh, not knowing that uh, in about nine years, uh, my mother would become a patient of Arkansas Hospice. Um, I remember getting the call. At that time, I was working in Cabot because I had just gotten the position of bereavement specialist. And I was working at Cabot and my sister called me and she said that at the time, Dr. Carradine was seeing my mother. And uh, my sister said that Dr. Carradine wanted to see both, wanted to meet with both of us. And deep in the pit of my stomach, I knew what was going to happen. So I got to gather some information so I could bring it home so my sister could read it. But uh, she was admitted. She had a wonderful team of uh, the physician, social worker, nurse, and chaplain. Uh, about a month into her admittance, she was admitted to the hospital and she died. And so that was my personal experience with Arkansas Hospital. Thanks to both of you for sharing such personal stories with us this evening. Often in minority communities, hospice is misunderstood. When I taught death and dying at another university, uh, I, we would often discuss in class the concept of the horse on the dining room table. Everyone sees it, but no one acknowledges it. Uh, in your experience, how have minorities traditionally perceived hospice care? Well, oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, 
for one, now when I started, I knew nothing about hospice and you know what went on. But minorities have always thought that when you are admitted into Arkansas hospice, that they just let you die. And that's not the case. And so that's that's one of the that's one of the things is that they just let you die. They take away all your medicines. And then you're just you're just there. I've even heard people say you're denied food while you're in hospital. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, you starve to death. Uh, right. And I have in, I have encountered friends that I have not seen in a long time. And they say, well, you know, where are you working? And so I say, Arkansas Hospice. And they go, mm, I just I, I just don't think I can do that. And so their perception is, you know, it's just not good. Dr. Washington, do you want to address? Uh, the, yes, sir. The very first thing that happens is I do. I've dealt very little with inpatient hospice. Almost my entire career has been outpatient hospice, and I've been doing some form of outpatient hospice for over 25 years. The first thing that happens is that when you introduce the concept, everyone gets upset because you think that everyone has given up. And so the first thing I have to spend my time doing as a primary care provider introducing the concept is making them understand that there are times when there is no more treatment that we as physicians have to offer. And that my goal is to make the last time on earth as peaceful and comfortable and pleasurable as we possibly can. And it is not that we're given up, it's that we've run out. But just because you've run out doesn't mean that you've given up. And I think the biggest problem that we have is that in the state of Arkansas, there are not enough physicians of color who understand the cultural aspect and the cultural approach that patients have and that they need to make. And so there remains a mistrust. When you have that mistrust and someone tries to present to you that we want to help your family member, we're not trying to kill your family member. We want to help your family member. Right. Unless they have that trusting relationship, they're not going to accept it. I've been called on multiple occasions for when it's even not time for hospice, but actually just time for them to stop aggressive care. And physician friends have asked me to come and speak with families to help them understand because they don't trust what's happening. And until they either see a familiar face or someone who looks like them, who talks like them and understands their background, they're not willing to accept it. That's the first one. The next thing is, is that it's really difficult to make people understand that just because you get admitted to hospice, that you're not fit, you're getting ready to just drop dead. It doesn't mean that. I mean, you know, by definition, to qualify for hospice, it is assumed that based on all of our medical knowledge, but all of our medical knowledge and all the treatments that we have to offer, that the current condition that you have will cause the end of your life over the next six months. That's what the definition is when we get ready to admit someone to hospice. So even when we're admitting you to hospice, we expect you to live anywhere from four to six months, but we want you to live that four to six months. And so it's how it's presented. Uh, it's how the trust is. And so many people are not offered that until the very end of life. And so, so many of these patients get hospice care, but they only get it in the last three to four days and sometimes the last week of life. So the concept in the minds of family members and all is that you're going on hospice to die, not going on hospice to live. And so we have to spread the word that hospice allows you to live. <coughs> I've had personally multiple family members who have been hospice patients. My mother died with colon cancer and was a hospice patient. Um, and I explained, and we sat down, my mom, my dad, and I, we all sat down, we talked about the decision. My mother had colon cancer and she had received a standard of care treatment. Uh, she moved to the next level of treatment and she moved to the next level. 
and the physician offered her an experimental treatment that he said would reduce her tumor burden by 10%, but it would also have extremely poor side effects that would make her sick and vomiting and make her lose all her hair. Despite the decline she had had, she wasn't experiencing that. She had some pain, but otherwise she was not experiencing any difficulties like that. And she was going to say yes. And I asked her why she wanted to say yes. She said because she didn't want us to think that she had given up a living. So even in my own family, I had to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. And we all talked about what it meant. And then my mom and dad I asked them to go home and pray about it together and make a decision. And I wasn't going to be involved because I wanted them to make a decision that was best for them. When they finally made the decision, they chose hospice. And then my mom recognized that all the things that she did all day, every day that she was doing, she was still going to be doing all the things that she felt like doing. And on days when she was uncertain about getting in and out of the tub, she had someone to come help her remain independent. And that worked well until the very end of my mother's life. And when we got to the very end of my mother's life, and she began to have some difficulty breathing and all, and she was at home, my son was there, uh, a niece that's very close, multiple family members were there, and she had a little difficulty breathing. My dad got nervous. He said, do we need to take her to the hospital? And I said, no. I said, this is why we have hospice so that when she gets uncomfortable, she doesn't have to remain uncomfortable. We can make her comfortable. The hospice nurse came, uh, gave meds to help relax her lungs so that she wasn't struggling to breathe. And she was able to talk with us and visit with us. And my dad finally looked at my mom and said, I understand and I know where you're gonna be and I'm going to be okay. My mom smiled at my father, took a big deep breath, let it out, and that was her last breath. But that couldn't have happened if I wasn't so close to my family to make them understand that that could have been a one that had to be that could be a wonderful thing. And to the and my dad became a great hospice advocate because he began telling his friends and sharing with them about the wonderful experience that he had had. That they weren't cracking her chest, they weren't doing different things, and that she was peaceful, and that the kids were all there, and everybody was there. And my dad became probably one of the greatest advocates of hospice after our own personal experience. And so the more we get people to have a positive experience, especially the outpatient experiences, the greater we can help other people understand it's a good thing. Thank you for sharing such a personal and touching story. What is the biggest cultural hindrance to utilizing hospice? I hear that it's a cultural thing, but what does that specifically mean? Many times, I don't think that they have an understanding that there is not going to be a removal of their religious experience. Some people fear that they're taking God out of the, the end of life. And so... All the hospices have a chaplain that work with the families and all. And even if the top hospice chaplain doesn't have adequate religious experience to help them, they do seek someone of like religious beliefs so they can begin to share. And so a difference in religious, religious cultural behaviors and religious, religious rituals sometimes make them have a cultural difference. Uh, for instance, I had an experience because I was, I was actually a religion major in college and I did comparative religious studies. And so I had a patient that was struggling because they were to a point where the nurse that was administering to them didn't understand that they were Catholic and didn't understand that they needed, they needed, not just wanted, but from their perspective, they needed last rites. And I made it my priority to help find one of my friends who was actually in school to become a priest. I actually called him and he came over and administered last rites. Well, that changed that family's whole perspective. But it's very difficult for the nurse who has never been around Catholic people to understand. And the chaplain, they had refused chaplain services and initially because they were Catholic. And the chaplain was a Protestant or of religion, 
And they didn't understand that the the chaplain wasn't going to be biased. They were going to be a spiritual advisor and would help them no matter. But so that cut them off for that for a while. And so those are little things that people think that you have to give up your religious preferences. You have to adopt a way and change who you are and what you are in order to get that treatment. Yeah. Ms. Gaines, do you want to address that also? No, she said it all right there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Most people are skeptic uh, when skeptical when it comes to new things. Uh, I know that we are hesitant to try new things that uh, come into our paths. When you stop and think about it, hospice in America is a new thing. It's only been here since 1974. So for 46 years, hospice has struggled with images and trying to tear down barriers in cultural uh, communities. What is it that we can do to address issues of access for minority families? I think awareness um, is, is quite important. Um, many minorities don't understand what hospice is. Uh, and I think that the more that we talk, um, just like what we're doing right now, I think it's an ideal uh, situation to um, help minorities understand. Other thing uh, would be in our churches. Absolutely, absolutely. I think in your churches that that's uh, that's a good good stepping point right there. Uh, you know, I always thought that maybe like doing morning worship at some point after service or whatever, uh, invite someone um, from hospice to come in and talk. And so I think awareness is the key. Or when you're like, when you meet friends or something, uh, uh, you meet your friends that you haven't seen in a long time and they, you know, they have that, ooh, then you explain to them exactly what hospice is about so that's that's my point of view what are some other inroads that we can make in uh providing information you mentioned churches uh what about physicians offices and dentist offices barbershops and beauty salons uh these are all uh, male salons places that people will frequent how will that is is that a good avenue for uh, trying to reach the masses to inform about hospice. It um, is. If we could get uh, like pamphlets <clears throat> and put them in the beauty shops, barber shops, physicians' offices, or whatever. Um, say, for instance, if you're at the beauty shop, you can, ex you know, you talk to the owner and you tell them exactly what you're aiming to do. Um, and enlist them to help you out. One of the things we talked about, and I think people forget, is that uh, you got to have a good relationship with the funeral home owner. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I say this is because if we provide an adequate education and understanding of hospice to many funeral home owners, one of the things that happens in many uh, communities of people of color is they plan for the end of life. And one of the things that they do is they know what funeral home they're going to use. My family's used this funeral home for many, many years. And when Grandma, Grandma Paul, or Aunt Vada or Sue starts getting sick, we go to the funeral home and we start making arrangements. And if the funeral director has knowledge about hospice and has an understanding in a positive way about hospice, they can actually ask them, uh, will you be utilizing hospice services at the end of life? And by them introducing it, they can and they can begin to defray some of the fears and things that people have regarding this because most people have a trusting relationship with the people that they use in their funeral home. I understand that you attend Bullet Temple CME Church. 
I you know, know what happens in the CME church. And one of the things is that there are multiple times when the leaders of the church gather together for purposes of education and all, and the, the next level of leaders gather together. And so back to the churches, I think one of the things we can do is we can go to leadership of the churches and provide seminars and education on hospice services at that time. Because when the pastor, the pastor that's been there, now she's, we're Methodist, so they're not there a long time, but you're Baptist, the pastor stays there for a really long time. They believe if the pastor says the moon is made of green cheese and we must fly there and get some and spread it on a fee then someone's going to try and go do it. So if we get an understanding among the religious leaders, I think they can help pass the torch and help disseminate appropriate information and get people to asking questions about it and trying to figure out, is this an appropriate time to ask for hospital? But I think we have to have the leaders of the community that people of color trust to be believers in hospice. And these are our more educated people who have a better ability to understand it, but may have a relationship and be able to break it down to the community so that they understand it on their terms and on their level. And so they're more willing to accept what we have to offer. One of the places that uh... It just dawned on me that you certainly need applets for hospice services or at attorney's offices. Um, many times uh, people will make living wills as well as their regular wills. And uh, this is a good time to have those types of discussions when uh, legal paperwork is being drawn on the uh, preparations for the end of life. In a recent survey, 55% of the people surveyed said they had no idea how hospice is paid for. How is hospice paid for? Medicare, Medicaid, and conventional insurance. Plain and simple. <laughs> and even though the Republicans don't like it, Ever since Barack Obama was here, everybody has the opportunity to have health insurance. Yeah. So no, no one has to be left behind. Nobody. Okay. And it is a mission of Arkansas Hospice that nobody is left behind. Has the pandemic made it more or less likely? that minority families will consider hospice care? Or has it been? <laughs> oh, that's a funny one. Okay, in my community, they're more likely to consider hospice care instead of less likely. But it's because of the presentation that I've given to many of them. You might have a loved one who is in the nursing home right. and you can't get access to them because of the pandemic. That patient who is on hospice, as their time gets closer and closer to the end of life, if they're on hospice, hospice sees to it that you get access to your family member. And so I've explained that to multiple people in my community who had been resistant to hospice care, who recognize that and say, okay, so you're telling me that if my mom's on hospice, even if she dies in the nursing home, I might have an opportunity to see her, even though the nursing home is closed to visitors? And I said, absolutely, yes. And Arkansas Hospice has worked hard to make sure that any of the family members that can be allowed in during this time in their family's life, they can get in and spend that time with them. Some of the patients who have been nursing home patients who can't get into the nursing home, hospice has been able to bring them home, even though it may only be 24 or 48 hours but they get to spend the last 24, 48 hours with their loved ones. And so I've presented that to them and they're now recognizing that it's all for real. And so they're more trusting and more willing to give it a try. Right. We've had uh, uh, questions to come in. And uh, the first one is, how can hospice nurses be effective in serving the minority community? How can hospice nurses be effective in 
and serving minority communities? The first one is to let themselves be known. Let them know, the community know that they are hospice nurses and that they are available to answer any questions as your loved ones become closer and closer to the end of their life. They can tell you upfront and honest, what is it that really happens instead of the fear of the unknown? When you don't know about something, you've got all these ideas in your head of what you think it's going to be. And so you live on that until someone breaks down the barriers of fear. And the nurses who the people all know and love, who ne never realized that they were hospice nurses, they didn't even recognize the difference between them and a home health nurse. But then they begin to figure it out. And when they figure it out, they begin to ask questions and they begin to get more knowledge and people become more comfortable with the thought of using hospice services. Okay. And I also think that the person that goes out and does the admission, as she explains it, the family uh, understands more and more. Okay. And this is a has to be the question of the evening. What does dying well mean to each of you? What does the concept of dying well mean to each of you? I think you heard me say it earlier. <laughs> Does my surrounded by my family comfortable? Yeah. Because if you're comfortable as you make that transition and your family is with you, what more can you ask for? One of the things that we keep forgetting, though, is one of the things that we all worry about is what's going to happen to grandma after grandpa dies? All the kids have come in because everyone's moved. Everybody grew up in Mississippi. Everybody grew up in the Delta of Arkansas. And all about it, everybody came home because grandpa was sick and dying. And they all came home to say goodbye to grandpa. Grandpa dies. The funeral happens. A couple of the siblings stay for another week or two to help grandma get herself situated. And then everyone goes on to the rest of their life. Hospice has a thing called bereavement. And during that period of bereavement, for the next year, someone's going to check on your loved one who was the next of kin or the, the primary caregiver of the patient that was enrolled in hospice. And so not only does hospice provide us with support prior to the death, but it helps the family make that transition, helps the family be cared for even for the next year after the, your loved one is gone. And sometimes that's a bigger portion of what hospice does than the care that the family member got, especially when you recognize that sometimes when patients die rapidly, and even though they may have hospice services, they might have been a general inpatient, which means they were in a hospital. So the care that they're getting in the hospital wasn't as significantly changed by them being on hospice, but the care that their family gets for the next year is changed significantly. Someone helps them transition for the first Christmas, the first New Year, the first Valentine's Day, the first Easter, the first anniversary, the first birthday, the first, the first, the first. Those are all difficult times. And there are people that are there to help them through those times and to, to connect them with things in the community or to notify other family members of the struggle that they're having and to just give them ways to deal with the loss of their loved one. And that lasts for a year. Whether your family member was on hospice for an hour or your family member was on hospice for a year, you get a year of bereavement. Thank you for making us aware of the support that is there. We have some additional questions that have come in. Uh, the first is, please explain techniques for communicating with patients and their families about patients diagnosed with cancer. Uh, what techniques do you use for communicating with patients and their families about patients who are diagnosed with cancer? Those are actually not hospice techniques much as much as it relies upon the primary care physician as well as the oncologist. There are times when a patient will come into hospice and it has not been clearly explained to the family about the diagnosis. But we as hospice physicians 
and social workers and nurses rely heavily upon the primary care physician or the specialty physician who has done the hospice referral to explain to them about the diagnosis that the patient has. And so if the family is open to discussion and wants questions answered, we will approach that. But we normally turn that back to the first, the primary care physician or the specialty physician so that the questions of the family can be answered. Because before you can make a positive commitment to hospice, you have to understand what the long-term prognosis is for your family member and what it involves and what the treatment involves. And because we in hospice care for so many different patients with so many different problems and so many different types of cancer, it's we are not always informed on all the treatment options. And so we try to defer that to the specialist who has made the diagnosis and has created the treatment plan. Second question that comes uh, from this same email thread is, can you identify the factors that influence a patient's emotional response in the context of the African American community? Uh, factors that influence a patient's emotional response in context of the African American community. Okay, I'm trying not to be the one doing all the talking because I think there's a counselor on the line with us. The last time I looked up, is our counselor still there? I'm going to throw that to her, but I'll be glad to speak if she doesn't want to. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll add on. Okay. The the big I think the factors that contribute to the emotional response is first an understanding of where they stand with their disease process and what their relationship is with their family members as we're dealing with this. Because there's so many times that I've, we've de I've dealt with people who understand their disease and they're tired and they're ready to take their rest, mm -hmm. but their family members don't have a full understanding. And so they keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And it's very difficult because they're trying not to upset the apple cart because they're trying to keep everyone happy. And so many times we in hospice are able to provide a lot of guidance for the family about the level of the condition. But I find that nine times out of 10, the hospice patient themselves has a much better understanding of actually what's going on and has a much better emotional acceptance of it as long as we have helped them get their matters in order. And as they feel like the, the task that they have on hand as if, if you will, their bucket list, if you have helped them to complete that, they become more emotionally settled and emotionally stable with the situation. But they really have a difficult time if they think that their family members are not well cared for from their emotional state. And that also, the challenges of dying well, that coupled with what you said, Absolutely. How often do you encounter uh, instances that may be culture connected where remaining family members are hesitant about the patient dying in the home? How do you deal with those situations? The first thing you have to do is you have to you have to listen before you draw a conclusion. You have to listen to that family member and let them tell you why they don't want that patient to die in the home. It may be that it would bring back too much memory. Uh, are they just, you know, they just they're just not strong enough to handle that. Do you, is it frequently or infrequently that you encounter this situation or? It just depends. I mean, in my talking to my bereaved, I have heard that, I mean, that I have been told rather, 
that, you know, I just, I just couldn't. I just could not do it. And then they go on to tell me why. And when they tell me, then it kind of takes that burden off of them when they tell me why they don't want their loved one, why they didn't rather want their loved one to die in the home. I mean, Another many question. times I've been told by people that they're afraid that they're going to do the wrong thing, that they're not going, then they tell me they're afraid that their family member won't be taken care of. And then there are still, a, there are still a large number of people who have a fear of dead people. It, it sounds silly to us, but there are some who just fear that death process and they are fearful of it. Uh, I had one patient, one patient's family tell me that well, where's mama going to sleep if daddy dies in that bed? How's she ever going to sleep in that bed again? What are we going to do for a bed for mama? They're worried about will mom be able to sleep in the bed. And the strange thing about it was is that mom wanted dad there. She didn't fear it at all. And she told them after we got the family together and talked about it, she said, I, told, I said in front of God and everybody to death do us part. And I want him right in my arms when he when he meets the Savior. I want to be right there and feel him go and meet the Savior. And I'll be able to savor that for the rest of my life, waiting my turn. So mom was not afraid of dad dying in the bed. But the kids were all afraid that because mom and dad had been together 70-something years, that mom wasn't going to be able to handle when dad left her. And... The thing that mom was struggling with is she didn't want dad to leave her before he left her. So she was trying to fight for him to be there. And the kids were trying to take him away. And we finally got it open, out in the open and we settled all the questions. And so as a, in hospice, we want to make it comfortable for the family. We want to make it comfortable for the patient. But we also want to make it comfortable for the family. And so one of the things that you will recognize is that Patients have a, some patients have a thing that we call terminal agitation, and it's, it's, it's just difficult to get them settled. It's difficult to get them comfortable. If that happens, and as we make our visits and we see that the family members are struggling with this, we'll admit them as a general inpatient for the next 12 to 24 hours, not because the family didn't desire for them to be at home, but the state that the patient's body was in their physical being and their agitation was more than the family could handle. And we didn't want to leave them with that unpleasant memory in their own. And so those are things that will lead people to not want their family members to die because they're afraid it's going to be an ugly event because people have all seen ugly deaths. And if you, we as a hospice don't do our job to the best of our abilities and we don't keep in touch with the family and answer their questions and keep their family members satisfied, it can lead to an ugly death. But our goal is to have a peaceful death. And I always call it a Rockefeller death. You know, as I keep saying, you die like the rich and famous, in peace with your family surrounding you. And that's the goal, is to have a peaceful death with as many family members who want to be with you at that time as possibly can. And there are many inpatient situations that don't allow for it. And so hospice allows for you to die well. What is the role of culture in patient-centered care? How does culture play into uh, its role in patient-centered care? First of all, the culture tells <laughs> us what is the role of every family member. And when we're doing patient-centered care, we need to understand what is the role that the dying member has, that the caregivers have, and in different cultures, it's very different. And you have to understand the role of the grandmother, the role of the abuela, the role of the big mama. You have to understand the role of that person who is dying and those who will be surviving. You have to say, where is the, what is their role in the family? And it may be a very traditional family, and the, they are losing their family matriarch. 
And we, as all people of color, understand what it means to have a big mama or something and the role that big mama plays in not just our family, but in the entire church community and the entire community. And when we as caregivers in regards to hospice caregivers understand the role that that person plays in their family and in their community from how they interact culturally, it will help us to make the transition and to be accepted as part of that process. But if we don't fit into the cultural needs and awareness of the family, then we're not going to be accepted. I once was challenged by someone who said, I will be glad for you to come and be part of my patient, uh, be, be my physician. This was not as a hospice, but as a physician. But first, I'd like to pray with you. And I guess they were challenging me to see if I would pray with them. And my answer was, as long as you're not praying to someone other than God, I'll be glad to pray with you. That was the end of it. They accepted me. And they knew that I believed in God in the same way. I might not have had the exact same beliefs, but they knew that I was a believer. And so I became part of their process in a positive cultural way. Are there any other questions? Let's see. I think I see one that's coming in now. And we'll try to get... Uh, one final question in this evening. <clears throat> this person prefaced the question. I'll read it. I've been a social worker in the medical field for 15 years. One of the greatest joys of my job is when I feel like I've truly done social work is when I can help a family or a patient come to the realization that they can die with their dignity still intact. I find that the biggest struggle is explaining to the family that they are not giving up on the patient or letting them starve. How do you explain the quality versus quantity of a life mindset? How do you explain the quality versus the quantity of life mindset? Excellent question. It's a hard one. That is very hard. Very hard. Very hard. Um, to me, I think uh, the quality of life <clears throat> is very important. Um, I just think, you know, and First, you have to listen to them first. Then you have to get them to realize that uh, Uncle Joe, if I may use that, Uncle Joe's life was filled with whatever. And that, that, that quality is just very, very important. One of the things that I frequently do is I ask them, I said, is this, our, how well did you know? And I'll stay with Uncle Joe. How well did you know Uncle Joe? <laughs> did you ever talk to Uncle Joe about what Uncle Joe thought the end of his life would be like? So are you worried about the end of Uncle Joe's life because of Uncle Joe? Or are you worried because of you? Mm. Is this about you or is this about Uncle Joe? is you remember Uncle Joe as the man who took you fishing, as the man who loved a good joke, as the man who loved to play cards with his friends on the weekend, as the deacon who was standing there at invitation at church, all of the things that you remember about Uncle Joe. And I always ask him, do you, do you think that right now you still have Uncle Joe? And is this what Uncle Joe wants? Or is this decision happening because you're afraid to lose Uncle Joe? And then I usually step into the very deep waters and I say, do you go to church? That's the next thing that I say. And when they tell me, if they tell me yes, it's easy for me. I go, so do you believe? And so, and they answer me yes or no. And if they tell me yes, I say, so 
what do you know, what did you learn at church about the afterlife? I said, we sing all kinds of songs and things about it. And so you mean to tell me that Uncle Joe laying here in the bed, unable to eat greens, beans, and, and chicken is a good thing? Whereas there is a land filled with milk and honey and streets of gold that you're denying Uncle Joe right now? So is this really about Uncle Joe or is this really about you? And is there anyone in your spiritual life that I can come and help talk with you right now? so that we can give Uncle Joe the opportunity to retain his dignity and to be Uncle Joe. Because Uncle Joe wouldn't want to live being spoon-fed and diapered. Uncle Joe wants to continue to live. And we can give Uncle Joe back his life by letting go and letting Uncle Joe have that life that he's prepared for. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, that's what I say. It becomes more difficult if they don't have a spiritual life but I found that when I deal with communities of color, whether they be Hispanic, whether they be Asian, whether they be Blacks, whether, whatever we're looking, when we talk about the communities of color, their spiritual life and their cultural connection to their family plays a significant role. And when we make it about that person and remind them to make it about that person, they are usually more than willing to get allow them to have that dignity and allow them to have that peace and allow them to die well with dignity. Thank you. Do we have any closing comments by either panelist this evening? I love to talk. <laughs> so I say that I was taught as a child that the only bad question is the question that wasn't asked. And so for all of these people out here, whether you're online now, whether you'll talk with someone, I'm always open and there are many of us who are always open to, to answer your questions. Don't live in fear and ignorance. Ask the question. Get your questions answered. Let your family die well with dignity. Let them be comfortable. Let them enjoy life to the very end. Because I personally, this is a personal statement, but I'd rather live for 365 days than to exist for 700. And I would like to just die in a blaze of glory. I want to go out. Uh, ideally, I'd be 87 years old or 92 years old and just left my favorite restaurant and I was talking to somebody and I didn't hear the car and it came by, Roar, boom! and killed me instantly. And I know that I went out and I lived my life to the very end. And my job, my goal as I practice medicine, as I work with hospice, is I want every person that I encounter to live to the very end, not to exist. And just ask, and I'll be glad to help you get there. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Washington. <laughs> Ms. Gaines, do you have a closing comment? Yeah. I. I what I was going to say is that uh, there are challenges of dying well. Um, I think that um, those uh, some of those challenges begin with making sure that all of your affairs are in order. So that um, when you take your last breath, and uh, so that, you know, when you do take your last breath, then you won't have any qualms about, oh, you know, I wish I had done this. I wish I had done that. So, you know, beginning with uh, getting your affairs in order, awareness and all that uh, helps with dying well. Thank you. For those who are interested in uh, continuing education hour, uh, <laughs> or, uh, please check in at Arkansas Hospice dot org arkansashospice.org forward slash c e u there you can obtain your continuing education hours please allow me to say thanks to the arkansas hospice foundation and the minority outreach coordinator Reverend kyle jones for their coordination of black brown and the challenge of dying well I would like to thank our panelists again, Ms. Gaines and Dr. Washington, 
and those of you who are in the audience who joined us tonight and presented questions uh, that caused us uh, to continue engage in this con this context. We also want to issue a special thanks to the Repsolin Fund for their financial support in making this event possible. Please call and visit the other pages of the ArkansasHospice.org and, uh, and can call or email them with additional questions that you may have about symptom management and the end of life care. This is the last of our four workshops on this topic. Uh, thank you so much to Arkansas Hospice for allowing me to moderate these sessions. It has been a highlight of my career and I thank you for it. We wish you good night, Merry Christmas and a happy new year. May God bless America, may God bless Arkansas, may God bless Arkansas Hospice and each of you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.